Welcome into CBS Sports HQ presented by v- Z- excuse me, Zevo, people-friendly, bug deadly. Amanda Gary here with you. Football happy hour getting ready for week four in college football. The SEC game of the week, Florida at Tennessee. Are the volunteers finally back in business? The Southeastern Conference is home to some of the best rivalries in college football. So what better way to kick off the all-SEC slate on CBS than Florida and Tennessee? A heated gathering that's seen its fair share of classics over the years. No, sir, Ray. These two iconic college football programs played each other off and on for the better part of the 20th century, then finally began playing annually in 1990. And in a decade that saw both teams win national titles, what became known as the third Saturday in September almost always featured two top 10 programs in a battle with championship ramifications. More recently though, this matchup has been anything but a rivalry in the true sense of the word. The Gators own a whopping 16 and one record over the Vols since 2005, which includes a win streak that improbably reached 11 back in 2015. He's going to score, he's going to score. The Vols finally put an end to that misery in 2016 on Rocky Top, but then once again, the Gators began a new streak of wins in even more heartbreaking fashion just one year later. It's gone! It's a touchdown! But the past is just that. High up in the Tennessee Hills resides an undefeated group of volunteers that not only seek blood from the Gators, but respect from the college football world. And with one ranked win already under their belt, the Vols look primed to end Florida's five game winning streak in the series and perhaps enter the college football playoff conversation. But the Gators have different plans. Billy Napier, who is getting his first taste of this rivalry, is going to need his quarterback, Anthony Richardson, to be at his best to outduel Tennessee quarterback Hendon Hooker and the high flying Volunteers offense. It's the Big Orange versus the Orange and Blue, a rivalry renewed along the banks of the Tennessee River in one of college football's grandest cathedrals. And it's on CBS. All right, so how are we doing right now? College football against its red record. Brady, why are you shaking your head? No, I was just looking at my record last week. Yeah. Struggled the past couple weeks. You guys are nearly tied. Yeah. Thank God for the best bets where it counts as two. Oh, that's it does. Exactly I didn't, that's why I'm saving grace. Wait a friend. second. Who yeah. who made that counts for two? Exactly. I never knew that. He did. Well, now you tell me. Now I got to pick it up. <laughs> Amanda, we're upset because we don't like mediocrity. We want to shine. That's what it is? Because yeah. if this was my record, I'd be like pretty No, I'm no, not we're happy either. We're not helping people make money right now. That's yeah. the whole goal. We're going to help people to make money. All right. Danny Cannell, Brady Quinn, Amanda Gary here with you. Going through ranked games, giving you picks. We'll see how the guys do. Uh, this week, let's start with the SEC game of the week. The SEC on CBS. Florida at Tennessee, Anthony Richardson has yet to throw a single touchdown all season. Volunteers favored by 10 and a half. And this, the total is 62 in a hook. Brady, we'll start with you. Yeah, he's had a hard time in the passing game. And really after the first week where people kind of anointed him as this just freak of an athlete phenom, he's never progressed from there, Danny. And it's, it's troubling to see in part because I don't know that he's necessarily played uh, better opponents outside of, of looking at that game versus Kentucky. And he's thrown two interceptions the past couple of weeks. Um, it's, it's hard to have much faith in what we've seen so far from him on the field. And he's going up against the number one total defense in the SEC right now in the Tennessee Volunteers. And look, I've been to Neyland Stadium. I've played there. That is the loudest place I ever played. I swear to God, our center turned around on third down in the third quarter, and he looked at me. He's like, the ball is moving. It was so loud. No one outside of my guards can even hear me under center. It's going to be a tough, tough environment to play with the way Tennessee and Hendon Hooker have this thing going on. I'm going to go ahead and lay the points here with Tennessee. I've got to see something more out of Anthony Richardson to feel confident in taking those points without having any shot. Technically, he does have a touchdown pass. It was just to a Kentucky Wildcat. It wasn't to a Gator, which <laughs> we, is a problem. At that net, <laughs> yes. To another team. I think it's – I never want to bench a guy, but I wonder if Billy Napier is considering Jack Miller or somebody else in that system. But he went all in with Andy, Anthony Richardson earlier in the spring, but this offense is sputtering at best. And I'm with you. I think you lay the points here with Tennessee. I know it's a pretty big number in a rivalry game, but this is a Tennessee team that comes out of the gate. They're outscoring their opponents 228 to 61 in the first quarter. Josh Heupel, great job, you know, scripting plays out of the gate. They come out firing all cylinders. 
And if you get ahead, Florida's going to have to try to throw the football to come from, the hack, uh, from behind. That is a recipe for disaster. So I think this is going to be all balls. I'm with you. There's not only that, like when Tennessee is good, which they've started off, there's an excitement and energy around Knoxville we haven't seen. That place is going to be rocking with, you know, all the pregame shows that are going to be there. It's going to be insane. We have the Southwest Classic. That's what it's called. Arkansas, Texas A&M facing off in Jerry World here. Aggies favored by two and a half in this one, the total 48. Uh, Danny, what do you think about Max Johnson's first official start as an Aggie? Um, I liked it better than Haynes King. I think there was some stability there within Jimbo Fisher's system, but I wasn't blown away by any means. I mean, I, the offense to me is the bigger problem, and it's probably more on Jimbo Fisher and the offense that's antiquated and slow in an environment when a lot of teams are running up-tempo and they've got quarterbacks who are stretching the field vertically, he's dinking and dunking the ball down the field and utilizing Max Johnson a little bit in his legs. But I don't trust this Texas A&M team. They look to me more like the 7-5, and 8-4 and four team that we've been getting there for the last 15 years than the team that flashed and beat Alabama and that almost made the playoff during the COVID-impacted season. Sam Pittman has this Arkansas program rolling. Really been impressed with K.J. Jefferson, their quarterback, Raheem Sanders, the running back in the backfield. If you ask me who do I trust more at this point, I trust Arkansas. I mean, Texas A&M, some people said, oh, that App State, maybe they were looking ahead. Maybe they just weren't that good, Texas A&M. So I'm going to trust the team that I like better, and that's Arkansas. It seems like a struggle for Texas A&M offensively. They're still trying to find something. They've got talent. There's no doubt about it. Anaya Smith, Devon A-Chain, we can talk about those players all we want. The reality is... If their quarterback position can't play at a higher level, that's a problem for them. They're lucky to pull things out the way they did last week versus Miami. I do wonder how much of that matchup or that battle will play a role in this one. Two really tough uh, games back-to-back. -back. There's really no way to really recover from this one. And you don't even have home field advantage for this necessarily because you are playing in Jerry World. So for that reason, I think these two teams are actually pretty close match when you look at them. I just I know what to expect from KJ Jefferson, Raheem Sanders, who's leading the SEC in rushing right now. So I'm going to take the two and a half points, but I think the unders are really good play in this one too. I don't know that either team's going to be able to do much through the air. I think it'll be a fast game, a defensive game, one in which the under's going to hit. And I think I feel, feel pretty safe about taking the two and a half points. It's going to be a close margin. Yep, totally agree on the under. Another ranked versus rank, number five Clemson at number 21 Wake Forest here. Uh, Clemson favored by seven, the total 55 in a hook. Clemson still hanging on to that number five ranking. Still hanging on to the number five ranking. Um, you know, still not really progressing with DJ Uyunglele as far as the passing game goes. And I think, I'm not saying they're throwing it out uh, to the wayside, but everything's built through Will Shipley. You said this before the season started. That's what they found last year. That's what they've brought into this season. And that's really what they've been doing so far. But this matchup is one where it's just a bad matchup for Wake Forest's offensive scheme with what Dave Clawson likes to do, that slow RPO. You're outmatched up front. That defensive front for Clemson is going to penetrate. They're going to disrupt. You can't run those slow RPOs when you've got an offensive line that can't hold up versus those guys. So for that reason, I'm going to go ahead and lay the points here with Clemson. I know they're on the road. It could be a tough environment, but the reality is that defense is going to shut down Wake Forest and that passing attack that likes to utilize some of that, much like we saw a year ago. Amanda, you mentioned them being fifth in the country. They really don't belong there. It's more of a history, you know, and they, they've earned a reputation of being one of the better teams in college football. But this year, we haven't seen a top five team. We've seen a top five defense, maybe better, but I don't trust this offense. And if there was ever a game to get right, it would be against this Wake Forest defense, which has struggled in the last couple of years. This should be a game where they start to shine, but they haven't shined against lesser opponents all season long. So, I think they're going to get Wake Forest best spot and I, uh, best shot, and I don't know how many points Wake Forest needs to put up to make this game really interesting. I, I think you know Clemson. We'll see what they can do, but I think this will be a closer game with inside the number. I hope, like for the ACC's perspective, this is their standard bearer. This is their best chance to make a playoff. They need Clemson to figure things out offensively. What I'm trying to figure out. Similar to Jimbo's system, which is antiquated, Clemson's been running the same thing. Brandon Streeter is the offensive coordinator. It's getting a little stale offensively, and teams have kind of figured out what they're doing. With runs through Will Shipley. You got a quarterback who doesn't look like he wants to run the football. They try to run him somewhat. It just looks a little bit off. So we'll see if Clemson gets it right. Until they do, I'm going to fade him in this spot. It's tough because it feels like it's a system, and you're plugging DJ Uyunglele into that system and kind of making him operate within it. They need to do some more things that play to his skill set or strengths or get Cade Klubnik in there. I mean, it's yeah. one of those two options. Either you play the young guy, see what he's capable of doing, or you start to build that offense out around DJU, and that really hasn't been the case since he's been there. 
opposite sides when it comes to the pick, but both agree that we need to see a little bit more from DJ Uy Ungalale. Recapping their picks thus far, taking a look at some ranked versus ranked teams here. Uh, both laying the points of the Volunteers lack unity when it comes to the Razorbacks and taking the under there. And then opposite sides for number five, Clemson at Wake Forest. Coming up, we'll take a look at some games across the SEC. Big, big spreads in this one. Alabama favored by 40 and a half at home versus Bandy. Georgia favored by 44 in its game. We'll get Brady and Danny's picks for those and more next. Welcome back into CBS Sports HQ presented by Zevo here. Taking a look at SEC ranked games we've got coming up this weekend, including Kent State at Georgia. The Bulldogs favored by 44 at home, the number one team in the country. Uh, Alabama getting 45 or 40.5, 40 and a hook against Vanderbilt. Welcome in to Medigara, Brady Quinn, Danny Cannell with you here getting their picks for week four in college football. So let's talk about Kent State at Georgia. Uh, Bulldogs favored by 44. The total here, 59 and a hook. They've only allowed 10 points all season. Stetson Bennett, no interceptions. Yeah, they're averaging far. three points given up per game. I mean, that's, so that's what you have to factor in. That's probably what Kent State's going to score, I, I guess, unless Georgia just takes everyone out. And even then, I think their backups have uh, demonstrated the ability to still do that. But uh, these big spreads have been an Achilles heel for me uh, this, the past couple of weeks. I'm going to go with the favorite here in part because I've seen Kent State play enough to know I don't feel overly optimistic about Colin Schley's ability to do much, especially under duress because he will be in this game. And on top of that, you know, Marquez Cooper is not going to be able to run considering they held uh, South Carolina at under 100 yards last week. Uh, picked off Spencer Rattler and Doty, what, three times? I mean, it just, it's suffocating. So it really comes down to how much does Stetson Bennett play, and how much are they able to put up in the first three quarters? Because I don't think these guys are playing in the third quarter. I think they'll be able to put up a big number. I'm laying the 44 points. Don't feel great about it. But I think Georgia knows they've got to put up some big numbers here from, for some style points just to have a little wiggle room in case something does happen down the road. Stetson Bennett has been phenomenal. He should absolutely be in every Heisman conversation. There was a stat up there. 70% of completion percentage accounted for six touchdowns, zero interceptions. There's only two other guys with those numbers, C.J. Stroud and Caleb Williams. Like, right. he's in that – he should be in that conversation. Top five, I think, odds. Yeah, and he should be. He right. belongs there right now. Golden Flashes, they put up <laughs> 63 last week. I think they can score a couple. Did they play last week? <laughs> LIU. Long, Long Island? Yes, Long Island University? Was. The number's too big. I think – you're going to see with the you know SEC schedule coming up, Georgia rests some guys. I mean, clearly, and Did you take thankfully, South Carolina last week. Thankfully, now I think about it? maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but there also was a stat: Kirby Smart, 0 and seven against the spread as a 40 plus point favorite. Well, maybe there this you is go. Murphy's Law. Maybe this is, maybe <laughs> yes. this is the time when this actually <laughs> happened. They break this. One. I don't love this game. Like we pick them all, I would not touch this game with my real money. You didn't feel comfortable about it. Would you pick it though? Uh, You're okay. You're comfortable enough. I'm comfortable enough in picking. I mean, look, eight of their first nine drives last week on the road versus South Carolina went for score, six of those touchdowns. Yeah. So, I, I, again, I think they're going to put up a pretty big clip here. I don't have reservations about that. It really just comes down to how long are the starters in, how, how dominant can they be versus Kent State. Do they have a running clock in the second half, which could speed <laughs> things up? That would be an issue. <laughs> Stetson Bennett, by the way, uh, fourth when it comes to, to Heisman odds there. C.J. Stroud, Caleb Williams, Bryce Young, and then Stetson Bennett there. All right, let's stay in the SEC. Vandy at Alabama here. Uh, congratulations to those who took the over on the Vandy win total, yeah? Yeah. Now three wins for Ooh. Vanderbilt there. Was it there. three or three and a half? I think it was two, two and, and a half. half. Oh, and they went over half, already. Yeah. Over. yeah. It was a good and, call. You, you know, Danny had yeah, to begin to see. Yeah, on our Cover 3 pod. Yeah. We're sure, though, about uh, them that. Them and Kansas, both the two and a half crew that okay, both Okay, so over. what about in this game? Alabama favored by 40 and a half at home. The total is 59. Another big number. Ooh. I actually like the Commodores here. A.J. Swan, the quarterback last week, had four touchdown passes, zero interceptions. And Clark Lee is doing a really good job kind of changing a culture. Now, I'm not calling the upset by any means. But I think the one thing we learned from teams that are aggressive, we saw Texas and Steve Sarkeesian with a pretty aggressive mindset, whether it was Quinn Ewers at the beginning of the game or even when he got hurt and Hudson Card came in, they were challenging that secondary, got rid of the ball. I think that could be one of the key differences. And there's something off about Alabama offensively. Bryce Young had a couple picks last week against Texas. They didn't look phenomenal. I don't know what it is. You know, they have a lot of transfers. Maybe it's continuity, but they just look a little bit off. I'm going to say Vandy can keep this one inside the number. And for that reason, the offensive struggles, I'm going to go under on the total as well. I'm going to go over on the total. I think there'll be a fair amount of scoring for Alabama, trying to work out some of those kinks and trying to make sure Bryce Young gets in the rhythm. You're right, though. 
something looks off. To me, I, I think they don't have that dynamic playmaker like they've had in the past, or if they do, he just hasn't revealed himself quite yet. It could be one of the young freshmen who haven't necessarily stepped at that spot. Um, you talked about A.J. Swan last week, SEC Freshman of the Week, played phenomenal. What about their defense, though? I mean, they're allowing 40 less yards per game this season compared to last, a touchdown less per game this season compared to last. You talked about the improvements Clark Lee's made. He's building the foundation of this. And this, to me, and I don't, I'm not going to try to read into moral victories, but this is one of those that I think you feel better about yourself. You can keep this one tight for maybe the first half, first three quarters. I think they can. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take the points there, the 40 and a half. Uh, but I do think it hits the over. I think Alabama will put up a pretty good number. I think Vanderbilt will get theirs towards the end. We have Northern Illinois at Kentucky here. Kentucky, 18 straight non-conference games wins. That's the longest streak in the nation here. They're favored by 25 and a half at home. Uh, Danny, what do you think? So when I look at Mark Stoops and I look at Kentucky's offense, I don't picture them as a team that just easily blows out their opponents. Will Levis is having a nice year, but they still want to run the football and they want to play great defense. So from that perspective, I look at Northern Illinois, a team that's been putting up decent numbers. I know they got beat by Vanderbilt. They put up at least 28 a game. I think they'll put up some points in this one. I don't think they're probably going to get that 28 number, but I think Kentucky always kind of wants to slow the game down, a little bit more of a pro style. Will Levis still has been a little bit inconsistent. He did have two interceptions last week, along with two touchdowns, but he's sort of a, a guy who's not exactly, he needs to work out some of those kinks and the consistency. So I'm going to go ahead and take Northern Illinois here with all those points. Starting quarterback Rocky Lombardi for Northern Illinois knocked out last week. Ethan Hampton came in. He, he played okay. Probably will get the start this week, but this is tough going up against the Kentucky defense like you just kind of talked about, Danny, that I think that's really one of the foundational pieces Mark Stoops has done building in on that side of the football. Uh, but you're right. I mean, typically they would like to run the football. They would like to rely on that. That hasn't been really their offensive game plan, though, uh, with Chris Rodriguez being out. You know, Cavassia Smokes picked up some of the slack, but it has been more the passing game. But that doesn't mean they haven't been consistent. You're right. I think the only thing that concerns me about laying the points here with Kentucky is the fact that you've got Ole Miss in Oxford next week. So this kind of sets up to be one of those trap game conversations. We have those talks from time to time. Uh, but, look, I, I think NIL will be competitive in this one. I don't necessarily know that I feel as confident in them with a backup starting uh, versus Kentucky on the road. Tough spot to be in. I'm going to lay the 25 and a half points here. Tulsa at number 16, Ole Miss here. You have Tulsa quarterback Davis Brin uh, leading the nation in passing Ole Miss's defense. Only 4.3 points per game giving up right now. Uh, Rebels are favored by 20 in this one. The total 62, Brady. Yeah, I don't think they've really – Ole Miss has really you know, played anyone overly difficult at this point. So, I, mean, I think that the struggles, too, for me with Ole Miss is, you know, Jackson Dart, Luke Altmaier, have they really – you know, differentiated themselves, how they really set themselves apart, I think, for Lane Kiffin. I don't know that he feels overly comfortable with where they're at offensively. Uh, you talked about Davis Brin. I mean, this, they're, they're prolific. I mean, Tulsa's played some teams tough, too. So, yeah, at this point, I'm taking the 20 points. You know, I think they'll hang around in this game longer than people think. I think Ole Miss could win this game, Danny, comfortably, yet still be within that number. So, uh, I'm taking the 20 points here in Tulsa. Tulsa is 3-0. Versus the Rebels. Did you know that, Amanda? I did not. Thank you. The last you. time they met, though, was 1946. But I'm with Brady on this <laughs> one. I, and I think this will be a shootout. I think Tulsa, with this offense, which is used to putting up points, Davis Brent has 11 touchdowns on the year, over 1,200 yards. I think they'll have some points on the board. And I think it might be one of those shootouts where, you know, Ole Miss goes up 14, then it's 7, then it's 14 or 17, then it's back to 10. I think it'll stay within that 20, though, when it's all said and done. And I like it as a more of a high-scoring affair. I think, you know, and Ole Miss, we know they're going to get theirs offensively, most likely, no matter who the quarterback is. With Lane Kiffin and, and um, Charlie Weiss Jr. being the offensive coordinator, they're going to put up some points. So I think it's a little more of a shootout, but I'm going to go ahead and take those points as well. They're averaging, what, 43 points a game right now, so you, you know they're going to get theirs. All those exciting games before, what, 1946? Yeah, yeah. Some shootouts <laughs> and those. Let's recap their picks for these ranked games in the SEC coming up this weekend there. Uh, agreement for Brady and Danny. They both like Vandy and Tulsa to cover there. Danny said he would not touch, though, if given the choice, Kent at Georgia. Coming up, we'll head to the Big Ten and the ACC, taking a look at Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State. We'll get picks for those games and more next. Welcome back to CBS Sports HQ, getting ready for week four in college football. Notable Big Ten ACC ranked games. We're going to get picks here from Brady and Danny, uh, all tied up for the most part. I think you guys have one game apart. Wisconsin's first road game of the season going up against Ohio State. 
Let's welcome back in Brady Quinn, Danny Cannell here. Wisconsin at number three, Ohio State. As I mentioned, it is their first road trip for the Badgers there. Buckeyes favored by 17 and a half at home. What is your play? Uh, my play is taking the points here in Wisconsin. I think, look, they're perfect for trying to slow down that Ohio State pass attack. You know defensive coordinator Jim Leonard is going to come up with a plan for them. Um, they just came off a, a blowout against New Mexico State. So clearly they've probably had some time to be thinking about this one, how they want a game plan. But I also think this is the first test of that Ohio State run defense. I don't really feel like they've been tested this year. Wisconsin will test them. You know, Braylon Allen's one of the better backs in all of college football, and this will be that physical knockdown drag out fight to see how far along they've come since really struggling last year. So look, I think Ohio State wins this game in the end, even though the secondary has been really opportunistic. I think they'll lead the Big Ten in interceptions uh, for Wisconsin. But uh, I I'm gonna go ahead and take the, uh, the 17 and a half points here. I think this one's gonna be a little closer than people think. I'm with you. Jim Leonard, one of the better defensive coordinators in the Big Ten. He'll have a plan to try to confuse and slow down C.J. Stroud. I mean, good luck doing that. But I think this game could be similar to the Notre Dame game, where it's a little bit more of a struggle. They're not just running all you know, open down the field. And most importantly, what you said, what I totally agree with, is Wisconsin's run attack with Braylon Allen, who's one of the better backs in the country. Graham Mertz, they do not want him throwing you know, throw for throw with C.J. Stroud. So they're going to try to slow the game down, play great defense, and try to neutralize as much as you can this high-powered Ohio State offense. And I think they do it to some success. Ohio State will win the game, but Wisconsin will keep it in the number. A little lock unity to get things yeah. started. Like it here. All right, a tough test for Ohio State. Another tough test for Michigan here. 3-0 uh, and Maryland. You got Talia Tangavaloa maybe trying to imitate what his brother did this past weekend. That'd be nice for them. Wolverine's favored by 17 in this one. The total is 50. Nope, 62. Danny, what do you think? So I don't love this play. This is more of a... One team's been at least tested. The other hasn't. I mean, Michigan's schedule has been a joke. It's been really, like, criticizable. It's been that bad. Like, they need to do a better job of scheduling. This is their first time against a Big Ten opponent. Now, do, like, the last time I remember Maryland being talked about, like, hey, they started undefeated. Remember Iowa took, you know, came to town and worked oh. them over? I'm a little bit nervous of that. I still love the move to J.J. McCarthy. I like Michigan to possibly run the table and be undefeated when they play Ohio State late in the season. But I want to see how they pass this first conference test against Maryland and Talia and some of those offensive weapons he has. So I'll go ahead and take the Terps and the points in this one. Don't love it. It's more of a I need to see Michigan put a stamp on what has been an impressive start to the season against lesser competition. You said it. Let's go ahead and criticize the schedule for yeah. a second. I believe they've beaten their opponents so far. And then speaking of it, it's UConn, Colorado State, and Hawaii by 149 plus points, something like that. Uh, it's been absolutely ridiculous. I don't know that they've had a margin of victory like that. On here, we're going to say 1947. Uh, so it's been some time. But those three opponents they went up against, they combined for two wins. Two wins, collectively. Two wins amongst those teams. Colorado State, for example, hasn't even scored more than 19 points in any one of their games. Mm. So it has been absolutely a cakewalk. It's been atrocious. And you're right. I think it's hard to discern what to take from it. I will say this. If you schedule cupcakes, you do exactly what they did. Yeah. <laughs> they did exactly what they should have done to instill some confidence, I think, in me that they're going to put up a big number uh, versus Maryland. This Maryland defense has never really come along. They're constantly playing uh, kind of high-scoring attacks and always trying to play catch-up. Uh, uh, Talia Tungavailoa, I think, is going to be pressured in this game. He's going to make some mistakes. They do have a ton of talent, a wide receiver. Akeem Jarrett's one of the better players in all of college football. This is a spot, though, where I'm willing to we'll lay the 17 points. I think Jim Harbaugh and Michigan, they've got a lot of momentum, and they've got depth, and they've got a defense that's reloaded from what they lost last year. So this is one where, yeah, I, I can see why you'd feel uncomfortable about it. I don't have any issue whatsoever. I think this, this Michigan team is loaded. They're one of the top four best teams in the country right now. Did you have Ohio State and Michigan both in the playoff in your, pre your preseason picks? I, I, I think I did because I think I had the loser of that going in, which I believe is going to be Michigan because of where that Ohio State-Michigan game is played. And that could be the one thing that keeps them out because I love it. I think it could happen. I think they'll be undefeated, but that could, held, that could be held against them from the committee. 100%. We have Central Michigan at number 14, Penn State. Penn State coming off that impressive win down in Auburn there. Uh, Nick Singleton running all over the place, making a name for himself here. Penn State favored by 27. The total in this is 60 and a hook. Brady. Yeah, look, Central Michigan, I think, will be competitive. We've seen them play competitive with teams this year. They crept in for a backdoor cover week one for me uh, versus Oklahoma State. I know that was bone crushing for you to deal with. <laughs> uh, Lou Nichols, as we saw last year, led the nation rushing. He'll, he'll be a big part of that. He'll be tested, though. I mean, this Penn State defense is battle tested. The only thing I worry about with Penn State, uh, it's, it's not obviously Nick Singleton and their ability to run the football. He's the second coming with Saquon Barkley. 
It's can they get up again for a game like at home? You just went down to, uh, to Jordan Hare and got a good win versus Auburn. Do you lay an egg? Do you come out slow here where you don't cover a big spread, 27 points? Uh, that's my concern. So for that reason, and because Central Michigan's kind of been battle tested, Daniel Richardson's made enough plays to keep him in games. I'm taking the 27 points. Like, don't get me wrong. Penn State wins this game. But it's not that big of a game. I just wonder, I wonder where their emotions are at right now. Amanda, you know what we call this game, right? It's a hangover game. Brady's 100% right. They just had this emotional win, dominant win, and great environment. They go into the SEC. They're feeling great about themselves all week. Everybody's telling them how great they are. You guys look awesome. Now you could challenge Ohio State and Michigan. It is human nature to let off the gas a little bit. Meanwhile, your opponent has, this is their Super Bowl, their opportunity to potentially shock the world. I wouldn't be surprised at all if you look up start of the second quarter and it's seven to three. And you're like, what's going on? And they're just kind of slow, sluggish, and they pull away late. But do they do it in enough time to cover the 27? I don't think so. So give me the Chippewas as well. Danny Canal's first official hangover game yeah. of the season. <laughs> I've been waiting for that one. UConn at number 12, NC State. UConn uh, coming off that bad loss to Ohio State. There, NC State looking to start 4-0 for the first time since 2018. They're favored by 39. The total is 50, Danny. So UConn's one of the worst programs right now in the country. Um, and they surprised me. Week one against Utah State, they looked way better, but they've been regressing ever since and kind of coming back to reality. I think Jim Mora is realizing the job that he has ahead of him is going to be a long road. Meanwhile, NC State, after the game against East Carolina, which they avoided complete disaster, East Carolina missed a field goal to win that game and pull off the upset. They've been getting right. Devin Leary still, I think, is one of the better quarterbacks in the ACC, if not the country. I think they get some numbers for their quarterback this game, a little bit of a stat padding game. I don't think UConn has the, the, the guys to go out there and hang with them. I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, you know, I kind of looked at this game and thought to myself, this is one of those cupcakes for NC State where when you look at their position, number 12 right now, they were that dark horse for the ACC. And I think if they want to kind of continue to be in the conversation, they've got to put up a big number here too for some style points, not only for Devin Leary, but just overall perception of where they should be at. Because don't forget who they have next week. Clemson. Mm -hmm. And that's when I look at it and I go, ah, I wonder if this is a little bit of a trap game. UConn's just so bad. I mean, they looked awful last week uh, in Ann Arbor versus Michigan. I don't have much faith at all. I think this NC State defense might pitch a shutout uh, as bad as UConn looked offensively. And Devin O'Leary should put up some big numbers. So I'm laying the points. Uh, don't feel really great about it, but I, I do think that NC State should put up a huge number. I just I wonder with what you have a week from now, if you pull those starters a little bit early, you start to kind of look ahead to that big challenge of taking on Clemson. We have Miami hosting at Middle Tennessee. We have now seen these struggles for Miami. Miami still in the top 25. Not sure they should be there. They are ranked 25th coming off that loss to Texas A&M there. Uh, 26 at home for the Hurricanes. The total is 53 and a half. Danny, what's your play? Don't even get me started on the top 25. The AP is a joke how bad it is, especially in the last good 10 thing it doesn't really or matter. so. Yeah. No, a good thing it doesn't yeah. matter. Um, <laughs> I like Middle Tennessee here. I, I think this is a letdown game for my. I don't even know if it's a letdown game. I don't know how good Miami is. I mean, they played Texas A&M tight, but we don't know how good Texas A&M is. It was kind of an ugly game. I think their defense is pretty legit, but I think this is a game. And, and if you go back before Texas A&M, they played down to Southern Miss. This is not a Miami team that is what it was last year when Tyler Van Dyke was one of the better quarterbacks in the ACC. I, he hasn't lost any of his skill set, but the play on the field has regressed. Now, you could put it on Josh Gaddis, the new offensive coordinator, or you could put it on different weapons at wide receiver. He didn't have Restrepo last week against Texas A&M. But for whatever reason, the Miami offense has not found its way. I think it'll be an uglier game that Miami wins by three touchdowns, but I don't see him winning by more than that. To me, this is one of those like sneaky big moments for Mario Cristobal's team. Mm -hmm. You know, How do you respond after adversity? How do you respond after a tough physical loss? And you know, look, I'm not trying to put this on the offense for Miami, but you go in the red zone four times last week, you come away with no touchdowns, that's a problem. Special teams issues, a block kick, missed field goal, I mean, all those things. You're not going to have your best leading receiver, Xavier Estrepo, uh, is going to be out for this one. It's, it's a lot. And how you respond to that is going to say a lot about where he has this team's head at. Because in the past, you know, those University of Miami teams, we all hear about the hooting and hollering, all oh, they're back, they're back and they drop a game early, what happens? The rest of the season falls to the wayside. They still have a chance to go out and win the ACC, potentially represent the ACC in the college football playoff with the rest of their schedule. And I know this is not a game where I'm sitting here trying to tell you that they're gonna get upset by Middle Tennessee. However, I will say this, 
This could be a game for those very reasons. They could potentially be in that mode where they'll let the same team beat you twice, meaning allowing those, those bumps and bruises you had from that a m game to come up and sneak up and beat you. So, you know, Chase Cunningham, he can get it done for Middle Tennessee. We've seen that before. Uh, the rushing attack to uh, was it, Frank Pleasant. He's gone off the past couple of weeks. Uh, so this will be a challenge. I'm going to take the 26 points here in Middle Tennessee. I just think i, I got to see it from Miami before I believe that they're not going to fall off and maybe feel a little bit sorry for themselves after what we saw last week. A prove it game for the Hurricanes down in Miami. They're recapping their picks for these chunks of games here. Uh, a lot of agreement, at least when it comes to the teams there. You both like Wisconsin, Middle Tennessee, Penn State, and NC, or Central Michigan, I should say, and NC State. Uh, only disagreement between Michigan and Maryland. Coming up next, we're going to head to the Pac-12. We'll see if USC can continue to rise in the rankings in Washington coming off its big win against Michigan State next. CBS Sports HQ presented by Zevo, getting you ready for week four in college football. Taking a look at ranked Pac-12 games here. USC on the road at Oregon State, a big uh, test for them. There was a lot of USC love on this desk. Before the show started, I will say. We're hearing a lot of it up here. Uh, love for Lincoln Riley, Caleb Williams here. So let's jump into it. Number seven, USC at Oregon State there. I mentioned a tough test for them. Uh, favored by six and a half on the road. The total is 68. Brady, we'll start with you. Weird things happen in Corvallis. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. Uh, I'm not on that side on this one, though. I'm laying the six and a half points. If this number was bigger, I'd contemplate being on the side of Oregon State here. But I just think that offense at USC, it's one of the best in the country. It may be the best. And it's love, overwhelming. Love. And, and one of the things I'd say that I've taken away from Lincoln Riley being there, outside of we talked about some of the scheme, the, the, the screen game, that's always unique. They always have something different. And we can talk Jordan Addison and all the star players. It's their offensive line. They are so much more physical than they've been in the past. And it's one of the reasons why I feel like they've got a legitimate shot of competing, not only for the Pac-12 championship, but in the playoff, is because of the physicality that they bring to that. So, look, it's been a great run with uh, Jonathan Smith and Chase Nolan has been phenomenal this year, one of the better quarterbacks in, in all of college football, really, when you look at it. The bottom line is, though, uh, I just I don't think they're going to be able to keep pace with this USC offense. They are that good. They can score at will. They're phenomenal. Do you remember last week I told you I would not fade USC again this season? Yeah. I lied. <laughs> <laughs> what is it with you? One what more it, time. Why? Like One yourself. more time. What are you not convinced One about? of these tests – I, that of the competition of who they played. Okay. Oregon State handled Boise State. They went. They, well, Boise State. Came Boise State's down. not very good this year. Though. They're like, but they're not awful, and they handled them. Uh, Corvallis is a funky place to play. It's going to be loud. There's a ton of excitement. Jonathan Smith's been there five years. How the heck has that happened? Like it just quietly, but he's been building. They went to their first bowl last week, winning season. They're going to be rocking, and there's always. Like the weather in Corvallis is kind of funky. It's like cloudy and there's moisture in the air, like a dew on the football. I think that's going to affect the passing game. You like that one? That was good. Uh, and the number <laughs> here tells me something too. I think this one is kind of begging you to go ahead and take the Trojans and say, oh, they're going to easily win by a touchdown or more. I'll go ahead and take the home dog. Last time. Last, last time, time I take them. We get, this, we get this on yes, tape. Last, we next cut week. this and keep I don't this. care what the We're number is next week. week. If USC d does me wrong again, and go ahead, it just makes me look bad. I will not, I'll just lay the points all season long and take them as a favorite. See, that's what I was thinking going against Stanford. And once they took care of Stanford and the way they did, Stanford's like that, the, not that good now. they're not, but I, I would still say they're pretty equal to, to Oregon State. And I think the difference too in that one is the scoreboard, it looked close in the game actually was. Yeah. I mean, they kind of called off the dogs there the second half. All right, this next game, number 13, Utah at Arizona State. First game for Arizona State since firing her Medwards there. Utes 15 on the road, favored by 52. What do you think, Brady? I'm laying the points here. Look, Arizona's in a tough spot um, you don't have your head coach anymore sometimes you know people are going to talk about getting a bounce back from that I think this this program is more in a state of disarray there's a, a cloud with the uh, you know um, the punishment that they received for the recruiting violations back during COVID that's still hanging over their head over that hire and for Utah look they've got a shot at going and, and trying to play for uh, the college football playoff I mean look that loss that to start the season I mean yeah it doesn't look great right now because Florida struggled but the reality is they can still win the Pac-12 and go play in the college football playoff Cam Rising has been phenomenal. The defense has been pretty solid for the most part. I just think this is a spot where Utah still has a lot to prove. And, you know, Tempe's not going to be as tough of a challenge, I think, it maybe as it has in the past. So I'm laying the 15 points. I just think Valade at running back for Arizona State is going to struggle with the way Utah played San Diego State last week, held them to their lowest, you know, production of the entire year. That, that defense is starting to round its course and be the Utah defense we've seen in the past. Um, 
About Utah, I totally agree with you on the playoff. They should be in the consideration no matter how uh, Florida finishes. Like if Georgia lost to Florida, yeah. they'd be like, oh, it's an SEC loss. Like it should be the same for Utah. they got to take care of their business first. And they've been handling their business. Now they've got a tough spot. I think this is one of those emotional games. Like what are you going to get from Arizona State? You're either going to get one of two things. You're going to get a team that throws in the towel in the season – which is what we saw from other coach firings this week. We saw that in Lincoln, Nebraska, when it looked like Nebraska sure uh, threw in the towel. Or you get their best effort, you get the best fight. Utah's a really good team. I'm just banking on Arizona State, maybe to give that one last hurrah. You've cleaned house. I don't love this game. I thought about switching my pick, especially when you sold it. <laughs> Cam Rising has been way better well, since I'm, the Florida game. And, and, Tavion Thomas is going off, but I'm just I'm banking on the emotional. I'll keep it. I mean, Emory Jones difference. has never made the steps I thought he would as a quarterback passing. Yeah. It just it feels like it's the same thing we saw him struggle with in Florida, and I think that only is going to be exacerbated in this matchup because you're going against one of the better defenses, better coach teams in college football. Man, you know Brady's the one that switches picks all day. I, all day. I, I all go day. with it, all and day. I only switched one it. this week. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Unlike the first week. Where it was was like it this one? Six or something. No, it wasn't. Baby. <laughs> it was, it yes. was Northern Illinois, Kentucky. Oh, okay. And I was like, okay, I'm trying to check out some injury news. I was like, all right. Okay, okay. Uh, welcome back, producer Jack, after he was done shooting a commercial there. Stanford at number 18, Washington. Washington breaking into the top 25 uh, after their big win against Michigan State there. 12 and a half, they are favored in this game. The total is 61 and a hook. Brady. I wasn't a believer last week, but after I flipped on the tape and started watching some Michael Penix and just what he's done so far this year, that's for real. You know, Kalen DeBoer and the system that he's put him in, and he's really excelling. Uh, Polk, uh, McMillan, a wide receiver, like those guys are legit prospects too for the NFL level. And I don't really know what to expect out of Stanford. Like, I don't know where this program's at. They used to have an identity. You used to look at them and say, okay, they're going to have that power rushing game. You think of the days of Christian McCaffrey, um, go back for that Toby Gearhart, Bryce Love back when he was there. They've had solid quarterback play, but they're almost in this transition from – what was this power running team and based on you know gap integrity and scheme and now I, I don't know where they're at I don't think they can compete with the likes of a team like Washington especially in Seattle that place was loud and Washington beat Michigan State at their own game so I'm gonna go ahead and lay the points here uh, I know it's a lot for a, a conference game but I feel pretty good about it Amanda Daniel. You know what this is? Washington just won big against Michigan State. They're we, feeling good. They're in the top 20. Over all yes, again. exactly. But I, Ultimate hangover spot here. Stanford, I got to believe. I still have a tremendous amount of respect for David Shaw, but this is a program in a little bit in disarray the last couple years. And as the season starts to get away from them, I'm worried about where it heads. But while they're still, at least statistically, in the mix in the Pac 12, I think you'll get a physical smack to the mouth that Washington maybe even more significant than they saw from Michigan State and I'm worried about Michael Penix only I'm worried about him throughout his career he's been a little bit up and down now he's been flawless so far but I'm wondering if there's potential let them let down game here from him in this spot maybe taking Stanford lightly 12 and a half too many I think they win by 10. okay you like that I, I do no. like that. I mean, I, I'm not picking that. <laughs> right. that's no, not you guys haven't agreed on any of these games oh, so I know. far. I think, I think Michael Penix and, and Washington, especially from where they started, they, they understand they have to keep their foot on the gas. Mm -hmm. And maybe they've got something that we don't know, that maybe they are the best team in the Pac-12. No agreement so far. So let's end with some lock unity. Because I think yeah. I think that's what we have in this next game. Number 15, Oregon at Washington State. Oregon beating up BYU this last weekend. They're favored by seven. The total's 54, Danny. Yeah, here's what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. Do the exact same thing you just talked about. Because <laughs> what Oregon do last week? Right. They won big. <laughs> they had a great game. What is it, Amanda? Hangover. It is. But here's the more important thing. And this is why I liked Oregon last week against BYU. Injuries were one thing. But Bo Nix at home throughout his career – when they've got a pretty good matchup, has been pretty stellar. You know where he hasn't excelled? On the road. I think this is going to be a tough spot for him. And this is more about Washington State actually being a team that looks significantly better. And you got to give a lot of credit for Cam Ward, the FCS Player of the Year. He's been playing fantastic throughout this season. And the job this program has done, I mean, this is a program that fired their coach uh, a season ago. You know, the COVID controversy with Nick Rolovich stayed inside, gave Dickert the chance to take over the team. I think this team is better than a lot of people are giving credit for right now. I love them in the spot. I do too, man. I, and forget the hangover for a second. You're going up against the number one scoring defense and the Palouse. Yeah. On now, like that's a tough place to go up and play for Oregon. You talked about Bo Nick's struggles on the road. I just think he's going to have struggles versus this defense. Mm -hmm. uh, the way they've played so far this year, especially the way it traveled, went on the road to Madison, Wisconsin. You, you really saw them shut down that offensive rushing attack uh, and, and Graham Mertz. I think this is going to be a similar spot here. So 
Uh, I'm taking the points, and I'm not just taking the points. I think this could be an outright winner. I think you should really look at the money line pretty hard for Washington State here. As you said, Cam Ward has been one of the better stories at the quarterback position in college football. Recapping their picks here, going through ranked games in the back film. Danny, I'm curious, what is your hangover cure? Like, what were you handing out? Tylenol, Advil, Pedialyte? No, you just got to get a win. Like, that's why I don't, like, you just got to win, it's a win. Like, it might be <laughs> ugly, but. I think she was literally I was asking. literally oh, asking, literally though, asking. yeah. I thought you meant, like, the football hangover. No, I mean, that too. Just I don't ever win. get out of control, Amanda. No, never. That's never happened to anybody <laughs> up here. Big 12 ranked games we've got coming up this week. Uh, number 17 Baylor on the road at Iowa State. Last year that game came down to the last 30 seconds. Iowa State couldn't do the two point conversion. Baylor won. Texas visiting Texas Tech there. And Oklahoma hosting Kansas State. So let's start with Kansas State at Oklahoma. Brady Quinn, you sent me a message last weekend saying how impressive my Sooners looked. They looked great. You said you were very excited. Yeah. They are favored at home yeah. by 13, and you're not going with them to cover. Uh, no, I'm not. And it's in part because this Kansas State program has been an Achilles heel for Oklahoma in recent years. Kansas State's won two of the last three matches. Not great memories, yeah. I think this is a good fit for uh, Adrian Martinez, now the transfer quarterback from Nebraska. Uh, Deuce Vaughn is leading the uh, Big 12 in rushing yards. He's tough to stop. And this is more talented defense than what they played last week in Nebraska. So this is going to be a tight game. I'm taking the 13 points. I'm telling you right now, Kansas State, I don't know what it is, Danny. They've got kind of that, that secret sauce to slow some things down with that Oklahoma offense. And I don't know that this Oklahoma team is as good as what they've been in the past. I think they're building towards that. But it's going to be a tough challenge for the Sooners. And Kansas State coming off a loss, right? They're going to be a little bit more irritated, you know, looking to kind of get back, a little chip on their shoulder. And that's why I do think they're looking for their fourth win against Oklahoma in Norman since 2012. Like this, and, and there is something to that. And I think when you're a program that isn't that far regionally to Oklahoma and you have less resources, you get less amount of attention, and you've beaten them, you hold that against them. So I think Colin Klein, the former quarterback, has done a good job building an offense around Adrian Martinez where even – and Oklahoma's defense has been great, right? That's been a great story. But a running quarterback tends to neutralize that somewhat. Getting around, you know, you put some pressure on them. The numbers game is usually in your favor when you have a quarterback who can run it. I don't think Adrian Martinez is going to throw it through the air. I think they might try to slow this game a little bit down too. So I like Kansas State as well. By the way, Adrian Martinez, granted at Nebraska, he played pretty well versus Oklahoma last year. In Norman was there for that game. Came down towards the stretch. They did have some special teams gaffes there that kind of kept them out of it. But just saying. Kansas State owns Oklahoma, according to y'all. I've gotten like they have five the, two of the last three years. This. I know, two I know. I saw the graphic there. All right, moving through the Big 12 here, we have Baylor at Iowa State. Baylor ranks 17th right now. Uh, tough test for them. Iowa State favored by two and a half at home. 44 and a hook is the total, Danny. Baylor's 14 rushing touchdowns as a team leads the country. I think they're going to really try to establish the ground against Iowa State, kind of take that crowd out of it. I like Baylor in this team. I know they lost to BYU. That was a, you know, a loss that wasn't great, but I still think BYU is really a good program. Iowa State, to me, is in one of those rebuild years. They've had a nice transition at quarterback to um, Hunter Deckers, but I still want to see them play against a team that I think is a little bit better caliber than they are right now, so I'll take Baylor here in the points. Ames, Iowa, mm. where <laughs> dreams go to die. <laughs> yeah. That is right, baby. <laughs> You got the number one total defense in, uh, in Iowa State right now. They're playing phenomenal on that side of the football. Uh, the passing game for Baylor just does not look like what it was a year ago. And don't forget, Blake Shapin didn't play against Iowa State last year. That was Jerry Bohannon. Um, and so a little different approach. This will be his first time going around and going up against this team. Uh, I look at what Hunter Deckers has done for Iowa State. I think he's done an admirable job replacing Brock Purdy, who was a longtime starter there, provided some consistency. And Xavier Richardson, he's arguably the best wide receiver in the Big 12. So when it, when you all, when it all comes down, I think this is one where I look at it and go, I'm going to go ahead and lay the two and a half points. I think this line looked funky to me for a reason, but I think when you look at how these two teams match up, uh, Iowa State is poised to be able to knock off Baylor, even though, it, again, it wouldn't be an upset. They're the ones that are favored at home. Texas head into Lubbock, take on the Red Raiders there. Uh, a little close against UTSA last weekend, a little scare. They eventually pulled away. Longhorns favored by six on the road. The total is 60 in this game, Brady. I think it's an interesting matchup between these two teams. You know, Donovan Smith played well initially, and then it's kind of struggled for Texas Tech at the quarterback spot after the injury to Tyler Shuck. Uh, the Texas Tech defense has been good, in particular against the run. So it will be interesting to see if they can shut down, you know, B. John Robinson. Uh, this is a game that I just I like where Texas is at. I think they're building towards something. 
Hudson Card was playing through, still kind of having that bum ankle from the Alabama game, uh, but played well enough. So I'm going to lay the six points here. Uh, I, I think you know this is going to be a more of a high-scoring affair between these two teams. Um, but again, I think this, the turnovers by Donovan Smith continue, and that could potentially be an issue, obviously, for uh, for the spread there. So I'm going to lay the points. You talk about a place that weird things happen. That's what I was going to say. Lubbock is it's, it's, it. Not even funky is the right word, just weird. Exactly. Weird. Um, Quinn Ewers isn't playing, right? He said he's back still ahead out. of schedule, but still out. out. DeMarvion overshone, out with a targeting penalty. I know they're trying to appeal it. If he first comes half, back, right? it's first half. Yeah, first half of the next game. I like Texas Tech here. One of those kind of, you know, chip on your shoulder. It's the program. Similar, we talk about Kansas State and Oklahoma. I think this is one of those ones that they've had circled all offseason long for Joey McGuire, trying to view some life in this program. Donovan Smith has to play better. He's been a little bit consistent. He's been hurt by the turnover bug with some of the interceptions he's thrown. But I think this will be more about the defense. And that UTSA game, the score was a little bit misleading. That game killed me, too, because I had UTSA in the 12 and a half. Texas but were you able to watch it? In. Did you find yeah, it on TV? <laughs> yes, I, yeah, I did. I was but listening that, right? on the app. I had to listen to it. Yeah, but I'm going to go ahead and take uh, the Red Raiders here. They, they light couches on fire in Lubbock for fun. Yeah. What they I, do. I've been there. I called many games there. Weird. I've seen this. We can say weird. It's okay. Um, Wyoming at BYU. BYU coming off that bad loss to Oregon there. Wyoming upsetting Air Force last week. Mm -hmm. BYU favored in this one by 22 and a half. Pretty big number there, 51 and a hook is total, Danny. You know, I finally came up with an answer to your hangover question. Oh. You know, you need, you need some mouthwash to get that taste out of your mouth, like from a long <laughs> oh, night. Okay. That's what BYU needs after, you know, the ugly loss Strong against Oregon. Strong mouthwash. Yeah, they need to let it out against somebody, <laughs> and I think they're going to do it against Wyoming. Uh, Jaron Hall and company, hopefully getting back some of his weapons that have been, you know, hung up and injured, you know, keeping a close eye on uh, Nakua and Romney, see if they'll come back to f uh, full force. They were without a bunch of guys against Oregon, counting on some of them to come back at full force. I think they'll go ahead and beat Wyoming, especially since Wyoming did beat Air Force. I think they kind of woke them up. Those Zatanas will be up. I think by BYU gets the most of them. I'm a little concerned from, you know, the physical nature of what we saw last week versus Oregon. BYU got beat up up front. They had a hard time running the football versus that Oregon defensive front. We talked about that being an issue. And Jaron Hall, at the end of the game, the stats look good, but it was really fourth quarter, kind of garbage time, you know, getting some of that going. And Wyoming, they're a team that's on a three-game win streak. You know, remember, they got dismantled by the transfer portal in the offseason. Craig Bull has started to build this whole thing up. And if you, if you look at Titus Swen, the running back, I think he can keep them in this game at least close enough. And look, BYU could win by three scores here, and we're still looking at that as a solid performance. But you talked about it. Uh, you know, holding Air Force to the lowest total of the season, and mind you, 171 rushing yards. And that sounds like kind of a lot when you take into account that I don't know that Air Force rushed for less than 460 uh, in the previous two games they had. That's saying something. So I think they'll be able to stop the rushing attack for BYU enough to be able to stay within this number. So I'm taking the 22 and a half points here in Wyoming. Titus Wynn, one of my favorite post-game interviews I have ever done. They told us, hey, he's a little quiet, and he, he talked for like five minutes straight. It was awesome. They're he's recapping their picks. Yeah, he's been absolutely awesome there. How did, I wasn't here with you guys last week because you guys don't agree on a whole lot this week. Did you guys it's differ about a average. lot? It's about, no, it's it's about, about the, the same. same. Yeah, I actually think we had more agreement on the picks than we have in a while. Yeah. Okay. All right. There was one week we only had two of the same picks. Working through. Working yeah. through. It is time for your worry-free pick presented by Zevo People Friendly Bug Deadly here. Your best bet for week four, Brady. We'll start with you. So it's worth uh, two points? This is worth two okay. points. Uh, and this is one where I, I hate to do it because I love Joe Moorhead, the head coach for Akron, but they are just not good right now. I mean, they're averaging giving up 46 points per game. They're taking on Liberty. I'm laying the points here with Liberty. I think Hugh Freeze could potentially find himself up for some head coaching jobs. Maybe this is one of those with all these openings coming open. You get some style points. You put up a big number here. Uh, Caden Salter, their quarterbacks, lead them in rushing. He's been big uh, offensively along with Data Hunter in the backfield. So this is one where I think Akron's going to have a hard time with Liberty. You lay the 27 and a half points here. Don't worry about it. I like it. I'm with you too. Hugh Freeze probably in line for a pretty big job uh, if he wants to take it. I'm going to go to Miami. We talked about the Miami Hurricanes coming off that rough loss against Texas A&M. They're going to come back home. There's going to be nobody at the game because Miami Hurricanes fans, they don't want to take the bus down to the stadium. It's going to be quiet. There's going to be a slow start to this game. Middle Tennessee will cover this number 25 and a half. Way too big for me. I'm still curious what this Miami offense is going to be when it's all said and done. Until they figure it out, I don't trust them to blow out many teams. 
let alone Middle Tennessee. I think you'll see a similar game to Southern Miss, which happened before the Texas A&M game, where Southern Miss covered too. So give me Middle Tennessee. Uh, producer Jack let me know like five times. Worth one. It is yeah. just worth one. But if you picked it earlier, then you get... Second half of the season, we could maybe investigate making it worth two. I think that'd be fun. That's fine. on how many I'm down. We'll see. Uh, lock Unity picks. Jack, how many did we have this week? One, two, yeah, three, four, than four than five. five. We've had like a new record this We've season. We've had three the last couple weeks. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, clearly. Good. See? So lock those bad boys up. There you go. There's your confetti. There's your lock unity. Uh, take a little screenshot. You can see it through the confetti falling there. Brady Quinn, Danny Cannell, Amanda Guerra. Enjoy week four. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.